when you talk about interpersonal relationships and how you interact with one another, sometimes we're not very much aware of ourselves. And uh, I came across a Jahari window when I was in the ministry after about 10 years and realized that by studying the Jahari window, it helped me to become more aware of myself, to be more healthy, helped me to understand people better. I'd like to share it with you. I was in a seminary, a class of about 60 people or so, and we were exposed to the Jahari window. And what we learned from that, what I learned from it, was two psychologists back in the 50s by the name of Joe and Harry, by the way, put their names together. And Joe and Harry uh, came together to understand human growth and development, and more particularly, came to understand personality development. They observed in their observational studies that each of us, all of us, me included, have four parts to ourselves that we should be aware of. The first box or the first self would be our public self. This is what I know about myself to be true and it's what other people know about me to be true. It's my, it's my public self. My hidden self is the second box. It's what I know about myself to be true and it's what nobody else knows. It's just what I know, it's my secrets. I, I would digress a little bit to say there's a difference between what's private and what's the secret. We'll say, for instance, what goes on between a husband and wife is private, but it's not a secret. The hidden self deals more with our secrets. This is something that we don't want anyone to know, and uh, therefore we're going to hide it and keep it to ourselves. The, other, the third box is the other self box. The other self box is what other people know about me to be true that I don't know about myself. You find that, at least I find that, rather interesting because you would think after living with oneself for 57 years, he would know everything there is to know about him but we find that that's not true, especially according to Joe and Harry. And then the uh, fourth box, the unknown self box. This is the box that I don't know about myself and nobody else knows. It's yet to be discovered. That's interesting because you, you can see, I guess, in life that uh, is progressive and we still have things to learn. And you can see where someone who uh, acts like they know it all, you can see where they lack an understanding with that. And so what I want to share with you about Joe, Joe and Harry's window is this. What I found to be helpful is Joe and Harry taught that the bigger your public self box is, that's the part that I know about myself to be true, and it's what other people know about me to be true. The bigger that box is, the more healthy you are. And that's something to think about. In other words, the more secrets I have, the less healthy I am. The more that I don't know about myself, the less healthy I am. And the more that I don't know what I don't know, the less healthy I am. So Joe and Harry says in the course of life, the challenge of life is to grow your public self box. You can only grow your public self box by shrinking one or all three of those other boxes. It's an interesting, interesting thought if you think about it. So in other words, it's okay to be me. And uh, that's the challenge in life. Now what I've, what I've tried to do when I learn something in like psychology, I like to take that and filter it through the scriptures to see if it's consistent with the scriptures. And here's, what I, here's what I've come up with in comparing what Joe and Harry discovered with what the scripture's been teaching us, I'd say like all along. First of all, I think in Genesis, in um, creation, Genesis chapter two and three, God created Adam and Eve, and he created Adam and Eve perfect in every way. They were naked and unashamed. They had nothing to hide. It was an absolutely perfect environment. That's hard for us to even grasp that. Perfect in every way. It's hard for us to relate to that. And yet they were. They were naked and unashamed. It was beautiful. Psalm 139 talks about how God formed us in our mother's womb. So in other words, apparently God put our DNA together. He gave us our temperament, bent. He gave us our gifts, our talents. Um, Christ went on in the Sermon on the Mount to talk about he knows us so well that he knows how many hairs are on our head. Some people have more hair than others. So at any point, he knows us intimately. So whenever we're free to be ourselves, the way God created us without fear of ridicule or abuse, I, I'm going to suggest that's, that's the height of life. That's, money can't buy that. I'm going to say that is the essence of life. So I agree with Joe and Harry that the bigger that public self box is, um, the more healthy we are. It's, uh, it's an interesting box. But we, we all know after the fall that, that we all end up with secrets. I mean, Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous. None of us are righteous. We all need the Savior. We all need to be forgiven. And so when you think about the things that we've done or the things that have happened to us in a fallen world, it can get pretty ugly. And it creates a lot of secrets. Like, who do you talk to when bad things happen? Or uh, Most of the time, 
we don't debate the fact that we have secrets. I think the greater debate is what do we do with them after we have them. And so our tendency with secrets is to hide them. But if you think about that, though, when we're hiding something, like putting, putting them under something, we don't want anyone to see it, it creates pretense. Now we have a secret, but we're not going to tell anybody. So now we act in ways to be protective of the secret, and it controls us. It tells us where we're going to go, people we're going to see, whether we go to the family reunion or not. It controls us. We think we're in charge, but we're not. Our secrets are in charge. And the more secrets we have, the more we're controlled and the more we're in bondage, and it keeps us from our public self. It's interesting, as I think about the scriptures, of how thorough it is. I love being a pastor for this reason, because the scripture gives us solutions that deal with the issue adequately. Like, for instance, God's way of dealing with our secrets is found in the scriptures, he says, to confess our sins. Not only my personal sins, but even the sins committed against me. Confess our sins. It's an interesting word, actually. Maybe we're familiar with the word, but when we think about applying it, you think about how thorough it is. How would you define the word confession? Confess means to admit to or acknowledge or to tell or agree with, like agree with truth or agree with God. It's agreement. It's confession. It says in 1 John 1, 9, a beautiful verse, one of my favorites. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a beautiful verse. It deals with our secrets. James 5.17 says, not only should we confess to God, but we should confess our sins or our issues one to another. God's way of dealing with our secrets is to confess them and make ourselves accountable to one another. When we do that, it thoroughly deals with our secrets. It frees us up to be free again the way God created us. I love that part. The other self box is a very interesting box. I love talking about it because it's unique. It's uh, interesting. Like, for instance... I'm 57 years old. I've lived with myself every moment of my life. You would think I should know everything there is to know about me. But apparently, according to Joe and Harry, I don't. And I agree. <laughs> I think there are things that I don't know about myself. I think sometimes we call them uh, blind spots. I think this is why God gives us spouses and children. Well, how is it that someone can know something about me that I don't know about myself? And, and part of the reason is to that, there's some things about us we're never meant to see. We see from the inside. We know our inside. We display it on the outside. People see our outside trying to figure out what's on the inside. So, like for instance, the way we're created, we were never meant to see our face. Sometimes we don't, we don't think about that because we have a mirror and we, we see ourselves like that all the time, so we just take it for granted. But we cannot see our face without a reflector. People see us in ways that we never see ourselves. So they can see things about us that we don't see. Or sometimes I'll ask the question, why is it that we don't, we don't see these things? And often the answer is because we don't want to see them. And so it's an interesting box that Joe and Harry observed that there is a part of us that we can't see. And so Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I find that an interesting verse. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, because it sounds like uh, a friend's going to hurt you. It sounds almost paradoxical in a way. But it, a true friend will tell you what you need to hear, whether you like it or not. They, they love you enough to talk to you about this issue that may be getting in the way of being more effective. The, uh, the other side of that verse is be careful of the sweetness or the kisses of the enemy. So it's saying someone who truly loves you will tell you what you need to hear, and a wise person will say thank you. Joe and Harry says be aware of the other self box. So if, if your spouse says, hey, honey, I need to tell you something, a wise person will say, what is it, honey, that I need to learn? And sometimes in our group settings, sometimes a one-on-one -on -one with accountability with the person, it's a great time to practice that. People are not saying they don't like you by maybe pointing out something. They're trying, they're trying to love you by showing a side to you that's maybe getting in the way of your effectiveness either as a father or as an employer, employee, or whatever it is. So be a wise person would learn to listen to it. I like that about Joe and Harry when they suggest that. I think it's consistent with the scriptures. The, other, the unknown self, the last box, is a very interesting box also because you think in terms of like, um, what don't I know about life? And sometimes we find ourselves doing that. You know, it's like, what is there that I haven't yet learned? Or some of us may be sitting with great ability, great talent, and don't even know we have it. We're too shy or we feel constricted in some way. 
And so I, I often like to ask this question. I ask it to you. If God wanted to teach us something about ourselves that we didn't know, or something he wants us to teach us about him, say, how does he do that? How does he teach us? And a lot of times the answer might be, well, he teaches us through his word, and I say, I agree. Or he might teach us through friends, like we just talked about the other self, and I would agree with that too. But I w I'm going to suggest that more importantly, I think our greatest lessons in life are learned through life experiences. It's what we've learned. And so all I know about life is what I've experienced. So maybe God may put us through a, a life experience. It's our life experience that will determine what we feel to be true. So you can take objective learning, like go to school, get a degree, read books, but you're going to take that and filter it through your experiential knowledge. That's what determines, what we determine is what true or what is right or good for us. And so, so, God, so God allows life experiences. Life, life experiences is our greatest teacher. Once we go through an experience, now the scriptures take on new meaning to us. You could read Psalm 23 all your life, and it's like, oh, that's nice. We have a shepherd, but it doesn't mean anything to you until you really need a shepherd. And all of a sudden, Psalm 23 comes alive. It's one of the most favored chapters you'll see in funeral homes. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, that's like a, that's like a cold drink on a dry, thirsty desert whenever you need it and your soul's craving it. And so God permits life experiences. Sometimes we may call them trials or difficulties or hardship or suffering. And our natural tendency is to say things like, why, Lord? Why, why me, Lord? Like, in other words, what's wrong with me? Why are you picking on me? It's not, it's not God picking on us. It's not God punishing us. It's, it, we're probably closer to God at that point in time than ever before. It's God saying, I want to show you something. I want to teach you something you don't know. Listen to me. I got something for you. Come on, follow me find that very intriguing. It's in our life experience that we find and learn things about ourselves, about God that we've never known before. I, I lost my dad about 14 years ago, lost my mother this past Christmas, lost my uncle a year ago, lost my father-in-law in March. I've learned things about God, about life, and about death, how to be a better pastor because of my pain. And God sometimes may allow pain not, not to be punishing but to teach us, and it's in the pain that God uses to do great and mighty things. Allow yourself to learn, and when you go through the, when you go through the trials of life, uh, don't be afraid of them. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, talks about how we are kept by the promises of God, even though we may face trials in every circumstance. These have come so that our faith would be made more genuine, which is more precious than refined gold. I find that interesting. It brings in refining of gold when we're talking about spiritual issues. I looked it up. Refiner's gold, the fire, is about 13, or 1,800 to 2,000 degrees. Very hot fire. You take the hardened gold, throw it in the fire, and it liquefies. In a liquefied state, the impurities rises to the top. They call it dross. They scrape it off, harden up the gold, and now it's more precious, more pure, more expensive. Apparently what Peter is saying is what fire is to gold in its refinement is what trial is to our faith. It purifies us, makes us more genuine in our faith, which produces an inexpressible, genuine joy. And if we can learn to have joy in the midst of trial, we will have learned a great spiritual lesson. And so I think it addresses the Jahari's window when the unknown self, that God produces that. And as we learn these things in life, it makes us a better person, it enlarges our public self. If we allow God in our life to refine us, to work with us on our secrets and, our, and more self-awareness in our other self and not be afraid of our trials and that grows our public self box, we become a vessel, a better vessel unto honor that God can use in greater ways.